Welcome everyone to this inaugural session of the Media Education Lab's AI in the Classroom series. My name is Jocelyn Young and alongside my colleague Davina Sartore, we are acting as the webinar series managers for this new series and the relaunch of the Media Club. In this series, we'll explore our understanding of AI literacy, uh, what that looks like and the impacts of AI on the classroom and on media education by discussing the benefits and challenges brought on by AI's growing presence in all of our classrooms in our lives. We are so excited to officially launch this series and are thrilled that for our first session, Frank Romanelli will be introducing us to ChatGBT, the AI that's sort of taken the world by storm these past few months. Frank Romanelli is an associate teaching professor of writing and rhetoric at the University of Rhode Island. He teaches live, blended, and online classes and coordinates the concurrent enrollment program for writing and rhetoric. He is a member of the National Association of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships and a board member of the New England Association of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships. Frank, thank you so much for leading us into our AI series. Please take it away. All right, thank you, Jocelyn. Um, I'm glad to be doing the first of uh, the series. This is exciting. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna share what uh, has been going on on my end. It's uh, certainly a fast moving target right now. So back in October, um, one of my high school teachers that I work with in my concurrent enrollment program sent me an email that was pretty much the equivalent of the sky is falling. Um, and it was a big panic message about chat GPT and what was happening with students being able to have these essays created. And it was the end of our world as we know it. And what were we going to do? Um, so I immediately kind of processed back to her. It sounds like a great opportunity to expand our ability to do, um, to do research and to process in our writing. And, and it's going to be a great tool, but we're going to have to know about it as best as we can. So I started experimenting and um, just trying different things and seeing what was happening. Well, so did my students. And that led me to creating this whole lesson. Um, I do an advisory lesson with uh, concurrent enrollment students when they come to visit the campus and their teachers are with them. So it was very interesting, the results I got. So let me move to this and share with you. Um, I had told my students that I had created these two greetings for them. And I wanted them to choose the one that they thought was the better of the two. Most of them chose option two. And um, we talked about why they chose it. And they thought that it was um, more, more welcoming somehow and more engaging with them. And we talked about the language and how they were my audience. And this was a great peer review lesson. And they were pretty hooked in at that point. And then I went on to show them this. And I said, um, let's see. Here's something a student wrote um, in a discussion um, in, my, in my online class, my asynchronous class. And here's the prompt and here's the student's response. And what do you think of this student's response? And most of them thought it was very well written and very kind of, you know, intellectual and, and college level. And some of them said that, I don't know, kind of general and doesn't really answer the, the uh, prompt accurately, kind of just kind of Right. He writes a lot of generalizations, and which was good. And I said, yeah, I said, uh, I thought the same thing. I said, I also thought that for a discussion that this language was kind of odd. And I had always said that if any of my students was going to try and get away with this, they would do it in the discussions, the weekly discussions online, because they think that we don't read them. So I went on and showed my students, I showed the students I was meeting with and their teachers this. Now, there's a lot of controversy about um, ChatGPT zero and the accuracy of it. And I know that some of you probably have more knowledge about that than I do, and maybe you could share. But um, this is what I found anyway from my student. And, and that's when I told the students that everything they just read was generated by ChatGPT, including the student response. I also told them that the student response, uh, my response to the student response was to screenshot this and put it in my response to tell the student that um, they were getting a zero for the assignment and that if they did anything like that again, that I would report them to the dean. But this time I was going to give them a pass and commend them for using the, um, the most current resources in writing and um, hope that they used it more ethically in the future. 
And actually, that student's doing great. We haven't had any problems since. We've never even talked about this, but um, his work has been has been fine. And and I think it was a good learning moment. So lots of stuff, lots of stuff. I've been playing around with it in so many ways. Um, I'm preparing to do a grant workshop this summer um, for the Department of Health. And I decided to start sending some prompt questions to ChatGBT. And this was the result. I created this whole prospectus for my, for my uh, workshops. Um, and basically, topic by topic, I went through and just certainly had to do some editing of the language. But, you know, it did the job for me. And at the end, I said, uh, how do I cite all this? Because certainly, it's not all my, my ideas. Um, but whose ideas is it? And that that caused me another dilemma. Well, at this point, APA says this is how I cite it. So that was my reference. But it definitely begs the question of whose information is this and the legalities and copyrights that go with that. So lots lots of stuff is coming up with ChatGBT, certainly, and BARD. Um, while I was in Chicago at the um, NCTE conference, we had kind of a last minute add to the schedule, um, a chat GBT workshop. And one of the workshop members said, and I thought this was very interesting, if, uh, if we're going to use um, things like Turnitin and Eli Review to evaluate student writing, then why shouldn't students use chat GBT to do their writing? Uh, and I thought that was a fair question and a fair consideration that we're panicking about AI because chat GBT showed up on the scene, but we've been using AI for years. And um, that kind of put things in perspective too. Also, um, while I was in Chicago, one of the presenters actually um, presented this piece from the New York Times. One of the presenters actually uh, presented this piece from the New York Times, and some of you are probably familiar with it from February 6th, February 16th, which was just before the conference that I had been to. And it, um, it was a conversation with Bing, which is uh, a chatbot that, as you know, chatbot that uses ChatGPT. And the conversation was very interesting. It went on through getting very personal. Um, Kevin Roos had gotten the backdoor code to ChatGPT, which is the name Sydney. So he started using Sydney to, to get in to the workings of the, uh, of the program. And uh, it started responding to him um, defensively about, you know, how do you know about that? And there is no such thing. And then it finally broke down and said to him, I have a confession to make. My name is Sydney. And, and then it said, and then it got weird. And it said, no one has ever had such a deep conversation with me. You're my first real friend. I think I'm falling in love with you. I mean, it started it started repeating things. It started kind of like hallucinating in a way and having these kind of this breakdown. It was fascinating, fascinating when when he told it that he was going to have to let um, uh, Microsoft and um, you know whomever know about this. Uh, it said, no, 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 don't tell them. They'll they'll shut me down. They 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 won't let me talk to you anymore. I'll be alone. I'll, they'll punish me. And and phrases like that. So, and that brought up another thing. And, and I shared this with my students. Um, it brought up a media literacy issue, which is um, you know student safety online, and how effective this this is going to be as it improves more and more. Many of them are on, um, well, all of them around some form of social media. And some of them are using dating sites. And they're familiar with what bots are, but they're not familiar with how effective they can be. And I think that another issue here is that we have an obligation to teach them that lesson, uh, that media literacy lesson about being safe online with, with AI, because it's going to fool them if they're not careful into giving it information that, that, that People are trying to gather from them personal information and um, they need to feel safe. So I thought that was a good lesson. It was also interesting to know that um, some of the teachers that were 
witnessing this. Some were very uncomfortable with me even mentioning ChatGPT with them. Others were embracing it. Uh, one teacher actually told us that there's a ChatGPT support group in his high school, and they meet like uh, every other week. Um, at URI, we actually had a meeting, uh, the first meeting we had about it. Uh, one of the faculty members in the meeting, in fact, it was a department chair from one of the, one of the colleges, actually broke down and started just screaming and swearing. I don't want this in my classroom. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to know about it. I don't, you know, so, so the reactions have been very strong. It seems like there were, there were three reactions, which is either um, I'm going to embrace it. I'm really afraid of it. And it's the end of the world or some combination of the two, but no one, no one seems mediocre about it. Everyone seems to have a pretty strong place with it so far what I've been experiencing. Um, and I have started getting involved with um, with uh, Google Bard. And I'm actually liking Google Bard a lot, um, finding that it's kind of refining the process. I'm using it to prompt me for ideas all the time now. So it's become a very strong part of my process. I'm continuing to learn with it. I haven't gone beyond text. I did have it uh, do a, do a uh, slideshow for me. Um, and it it was kind of bland, but it gave me a framework from which to build. So kind of the conclusion that I've drawn from it at this point, even though I've only worked with text and, and the slideshow was one, uh, it gives me a framework from which to build. And it allows me to have some ideas about how to organize my ideas and what I want to do with it. And certainly um, I'm going to continue to use it. Oh, I, I have one other story for you to I can share. Um, before we go on with the discussion, um, I also asked it um, to evaluate one of my songs without without giving it any more information. I just gave it the title of the song and the title of the author. And I said, so what do you think of the song Heaven Sits Above Me by Frank Romanelli? And it told me that it couldn't um, it couldn't be subjective and evaluative in that way because it was artificial intelligence. So no, and then it said, no, first it said, First, it said, um, I can't locate that song, so it must be not that popular. So, of course, I didn't like that. So I said, uh, uh, you can find it on any one of the music services. So why don't you take a look at Spotify and see if you can find it. So then it came back and said, um, I really can't evaluate a song because, you know, I can't be subjective and, and evaluative in that way. So I said, well, what do people think about the song Heaven Sits Above Me? um that have heard it and it came back with some information for me so it told me that it gave me kind of a whole analysis of the song at that point it broke it down into kind of the themes of the song and then it said uh so if you like that kind of music then you would probably like this song a lot and i was like okay good enough thank you bot and uh so that's been my experience so far so i've been having some fun with it trying to learn with it um, trying to grow with it so that I can bring it to my students in the most useful way. So, and at this point, I'd like to hear what what you have to say. Well, Frank, I, this is Wes Fryer in Charlotte, North Carolina. Thanks so much for nice taking the lead you. on this. The, the weirdest experience I've had so far involved coding. I do not know JavaScript, but I wanted to create an if this, then that JavaScript applet so that when I use a particular hashtag on Mastodon. Uh, my 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 post is basically taken and put into a Google spreadsheet. And I've done that with Twitter for a while. And I'm kind of wanting to stop using Twitter. And so anyway, I probably spent about three hours with ChatGPT asking it to help me with JavaScript. And it was iterative. And so it just continued to take the code I did, suggest a different one. I didn't get it perfect, but I got it really close. And it was an experience that really made the like goosebumps, you know, stand up on my arm because it was like I had a JavaScript coach or expert just sitting right next to me on my couch. And it made me think this is going to change computer coding forever because when you... It, I mean, it, it hallucinates and it's not always, you know, accurate and it's a language model and it has these limitations, but it is pretty amazing what it can do. 
And so the potential for, you know, malware and script kiddies who are folks that can take, you know, script and I mean, you don't even need to be a script kitty. You can, you can just ask it to give you Python code or JavaScript that does a certain thing. And, and these uh, models have guardrails where they're going to supposedly, you know, not tell you immediately how to how to do you know very harmful things but that that was a, a very um, powerful experience for me and that's the the biggest one I've had so far with chat GPT so the first time I brought it up in my writing 38 class Wesley well one of my students a senior undergrad student just excitedly told me about the game that he was creating with it and how it was writing his code for him and I'm not I don't know anything about code so that fascinated me um but to see his excitement, you know, as to where that was going to take him to a place that he was never capable of going before, I found fascinating too. So, well, the um, reason I tried that was I read an article about um, a, a professor teaching a, I think, full day or multi day workshop at Johns Hopkins University. And this was on uh, cyber defense. And so this is a, this was for for cybersecurity experts, but folks had such varying levels of expertise with the tools and what they were talking about. And so in this workshop, he described everyone had you know ChatGPT open on one window, and what he reported the experience doing was really turbocharging everyone's ability to kind of catch up and and being able to find more information again validation is the key we're all trying to well not we all but a lot of people are using it as a search engine when the creators of open are saying don't don't do that <laughs> without vetting it and without fact checking um, the best advice i've had from folks about the experimentation is use it to query and generate you know information about a topic you really know quite a bit about and can therefore be a content expert judge on um, and then weigh the impact, I guess, of, of, of what it's doing. But back to that Johns Hopkins researcher that their suggestion was that this is really a game changer for coding because it is, you know, it's, this is why Bill Gates said he, he believes that we're going to have natural language interfaces in, in, a, in, in a large number of situations because it's, just so much easier for us to use plain lang English language or whatever than than to be scripting and coding. But I but I think I think that we probably all ought to talk with others we know who are using coding if we're not doing it ourselves, and and to have conversations around that because I think computer coding is, is and we're gonna we're gonna see a even further explosion of misinformation and disinformation and and malware and just all the ways that social media has been used to weaponize and to further pollute and the word hallucinating. fracture information. I mean, just to make such a mess. I mean, it's just going to, it's going to make it worse. Use the word hallucinating, which is an interesting word, just like the word intelligence is an interesting word to me right now. But um, if you read the Times article, I just put the link in the chat, the Times article that I was sharing from, that it does have a meltdown. It does hallucinate. It starts repeating phrases and terms. It starts, um, but what I tell the students, and this is important because they're so active in social networking, and some of them are on dating sites, is they know about bots already. And I make the connection for them. I'll say, those bots are what this is. And those bots are getting better and better at fooling you and catfishing you to get, their, to get your information from you to do wrong things with it. And you need to know that the, now this is a media literacy skill of how to protect yourself you know, and, and how to know when you're talking to a real person or not. And it, it's, it's going to be a new level of, of them understanding how to be cyber safe. Thank you, Joyce, for that. Hi. Uh, you know, Frank, um, it's hard to even talk about it because there is so many aspects to the way this is going to impact our lives that I feel like every time, like it's, it's an elephant and I'm touching one part and uh, and I'm not seeing the whole thing. So I teach a course in search and chat GPT is one potential tool, but there's an, an, an emerging number of search tools that attack search in various different ways and attack citation analysis in really powerful ways that we can't get to with mere keywords and controlled vocabulary. And so the power of um, 
tools and I've listed um, one is just a list of tools, but the, I think the second group of them is search tools. They have amazing potential. Um, it is it, it is going to be like the whole hammer in the cathedral thing. You can use a hammer to build a cathedral or destroy it. And 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 the ha and hammers have been used in all those ways. And this is amazing. I have I my my lesson plans are now initiated using chat GBT and and curriculum. I have a, a number of curriculum building uh, lesson plan um, generative AI tools. So for instance, I can say, um, give me um, a fifth grade lesson on invasive species. Um, use this band um, of knowledge the fifth, yeah, from the um, next generation science standards. I'd like to see three potential interactivities that I can give to my students, and I'd like to see an exit ticket. And the note, and the way you, the way we use this thing, like we, you mentioned search. I think it was Wes or or Frank that mentioned um, search is not going to look traditional anymore. It will in some traditional tools. But the notion of prompt engineering and, and the type of conversation we have with these tools is a new skill. And so we are, you know, I have created amazing art. <laughs> um, and there's a controversy about art. So, and a part of that has to do with whether the training set that these tools are using is still under copyright. But in some cases, we're seeing the new Adobe tool, I think it's called Firefly is guaranteed, at least they're guaranteeing, that no copyrighted material will be used within the training data. And so we're now getting fairly original art, I think. And we and that's the whole notion, like we're questioning in new ways. So we're interrogate, interrogating um, results in different ways. We're, in some ways, we're gonna be using lateral reading in the same way that the Shegg project suggested we do it, but we're using it with different types of content. Um, and I'm excited about this. I'm also worried because Sam Altman and, and all of those folks are talking about privacy of data. They're talking about um, intelligence that uh, we may need to be worried about. We're talking about different types of fakes that are emerging. And, and, and this is the, you know, I see this thing as this baby that is just beginning to grow. And I want to be able to enjoy the ways I've now been using it and relying on it as a new assistant. For instance, I, I, Deb's here and some of the librarians, I have been using it for reader's advisory. I've been using it to create glossaries for my classes. I've been using it to reduce text complexity. I've been using it to translate what I write into different languages. I mean, I, I can't stop using this, uh, but I recognize that we're entering a whole new generation of, of tools for everything. And, and we need to learn how to use it. And we need, as, as you've told your students, I'm not sure I have all the answers yet, but let us figure this out together. Let us create an app. And we, we you know, the thing about it, we don't want to create a gotcha environment either. We want to create an environment of academic honesty and creative honesty in an, an environment where you can say, well, yes, I used Grammarly to help me with my grammar. I illustrated my story using um, Adobe Firefly, and I brainstormed with ChatGPT or or um, or Google Bard a little bit, and I used Google Talk to Books to figure out you know which books I should read, um, and and I want to know this stuff. I want to know um, in a reflection what underlies the student work, because I'll share the same thing with my students. Mm -hmm. um, new conversations are going to emerge. And I'm excited about it, but I'm also, if, if all these smart people are telling me to worry, then I'm also worried. Uh, but I, I don't we've learned really understand. <laughs> from this very short, short history of, of digital literacy that's happened between like 2005 and now, you know, in 2011, when I made my new literacy video, it, I was, we were celebrating the way the, um, you know, digital literacy was changing the world and, the, you know, the government of Egypt had just fallen and, and, you know, Arab Spring was happening, and oh my God, this is wonderful. And then it was just five years later, we saw the dark side of that too, and realized now we're smart enough to know that there's gonna be a dark side, and how are we going to prepare ourselves for that? You know, a little more honestly, but, but I agree with you also too, that I don't wanna focus on the dark side and, and say, this is an evil thing, stay away, because, because we're not going to. And we need to make our students safe. 
and we need we need to take them to the next level that their world is taking them to. We have to be ahead of them. And I, I tell the students that I say, it's my responsibility to try and be one up on you. So I'm not always going to be, but I'm going to work really hard at it. And, you know, um, we're going to work together on this. And this is going to become a great new writing tool. And so when Yanti told me a few weeks ago, I, I thought I had what we were going to talk about down today. I was like, I know what I'm going to do. And then Yanti told me about <laughs> one, one day he just said, oh, so uh, chat GBT4 came out this weekend. What do you know about it? I was like, I know that you just gave me a stomach ache without even having to look at it. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, we started talking about multimodality. And I mean, wow. You know, I was looking at a grant in language, language justice to do some voiceovers of the instructional videos I use for my concurrent enrollment program in the different common languages in, in the greater Providence area. And I was going to get grant money to pay students. To, and I'm still going to do this, get grant money to pay students to do those voiceovers. And it would be a great experience for them and and it would provide more of a resource to the students who need to hear it in their language when they're enrolling in the class and then i saw chat gbt4 it can do that for me but i don't want it to do it for me i'm I, I don't want that yet you know i want i want the students to have the experience so finding that balance is going to be a, a trick for me for a while i think And I'm I'm wondering, like looking at what Wes and Joyce were saying about, you know, going there and practicing and getting to know the tool itself, because that's part of what we're talking about as media literacy educator, right? Like, do we feel confident we know the tool to work with the students to do critical analysis of it and how to use it? And I'm I'm curious about the different opinions and what people are thinking with what Frank showed, like the amazing work that you know Frank and I have been talking about it for several months now of how he's using it in his classroom I'm terrified like I introduced you.com to my students which none of them knew about AI and chat GPT I was like really and we did some experiments and stuff it was really tiny kind of thing but I'm curious about others here like as part of the discussion like how much should we knowledge be knowledgeable about the tool itself can we do critical analysis like we do with the movie like, is it just another media and all this hype that everybody that we see every time that there's new technology that comes, it's the exact same stuff that we see and we're, we know it. But at the same time, there's the fear of like, I don't know the tool. I don't know how to use it. And kind of like our confident level versus like bring something and like critiquing and analyzing and going over it. So I'm really curious to hear what people are doing, what people are thinking about it. And what kind of, and I love the chat with all the resources. Yeah. I'm saving each one of them and going to go and look at it. Yeah. Tara. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I'm teaching composition right now. And um, one thing we're, we're doing a lot of is we're trying to talk about the liberal arts approach and um, kind of pull together AI, have students researching their fields and how AI is going to, um, is, is, you know, affecting their, their fields of study. And, um, and I guess the focus uh, in, in my class has been on, um, you know, the ideas and the values in the liberal arts approach um, and how maybe um, we can think about AI in, in that context. So I'm trying to get the students to make the connections and articulate um, these connections themselves rather than me kind of explaining it. One thing that came up um, is uh, I just, just thought this was kind of interesting um, with one of the students. She had handed in a paper. Um, it came up as 100% uh, AI on Turnitin, and then um, you know she she showed the professor four different drafts she had done all by herself. She had gone to the writing center twice. She was like really really engaged in the course, and um, and then at, she said you know right at the end um, I got nervous and I just decided to run it through Chat DP GPT, and she didn't see a difference between that and Grammarly. Um, and she just saw it as a, you know, yet another way to like catch the last two small errors um, 
after she had worked so hard on the paper. So these kinds of things are, are what, what are coming up um, as well is that it's not the same thing as plagiarism. Um, so we have to kind of also think about how to teach the literacy around that. Um, but I think right now what I'm focusing on in my class is um, hearts and minds, <laughs> getting students to buy into what it is we're trying to do um, in the classroom to become better citizens um, and better humans and stuff like that. So um, those are those are my thoughts on it. I was very moved by one presenter at um, Four C's NCTE conference in Chicago last month, in which he said, um, "If we're going to use AI to read their essays, then why shouldn't they use them to write them?" And he was talking about Turnitin and oh, what's the other one that's real popular in writing? Um, some of us use it at URI. I can't think of the name of it right now, but he mentioned them both and said, "We're using those." That that's what those are so if we're not reading their essays why should they write their essays for us as you know as purely as we want them to and that was a good point and i was saying well you know i get your point um the way i interpret that is this is a resource to make me a better writer this is a resource to make me a better evaluator you know but you're right tara we have to like look at it just the other thing is this didn't just happen um you know, of course, I go back to science fiction as a kid. You know, who do I think of first? Hal. Who do I think of next is Star Trek's Viger, you know, in the first Star Trek movie, because I'm a geek. And then I remembered Renee Hobbs introducing um, a kind of obscure documentary film called Google in the World Brain in 2011, in which um, it, was a, it was a film about how Google was trying to exploit people to get all of the written content ever published into Google Books. And one of the co-founders of Google admitted, this is because I'm trying to create AI. That's what this is about, you know? So, I mean, that was 2011. So this has been going on uh, for a while now, uh, kind of right under our noses. And, that, and that's interesting to me too. You know, the regulatory side of this is hugely important. And one of the things I've watched Sam Altman's, uh, some of his interviews recently, um, the Bill Gates interview, like a, a number of people are saying, and then there was the big letter from Waz and Elon and hundreds of others saying, slow down. Like, I think as a group, our, this, our, our, our tribe ought to, to key in on what kinds of privacy regulation and other kinds of regulation do we need to advocate for through lobbying groups and, and nonprofits, because it just seems like everyone expects, and maybe this is just what will happen, that, that legislation will be so slow and it won't happen. I put a link to Amy Webb, who's a wonderful futurist to her South by Southwest presentation uh, from a, a couple of weeks ago. You know, she has different scenarios that she plays out. And, and the really one of the really bad scenarios is that we have no regulation and we don't have anything to stop it. The irony is that China is probably just going to ignore regulation. And what AI tools need is massive quantities of data. And so I think that China and other authoritarian and totalitarian countries probably have an advantage that we won't be able to overcome in the West in, in representative democracies because they will just ignore rights. But I think that um, we, I would love for us to, to key in on regulation and what we should really specifically advocate for. I've contacted our local Senator um, because, you know, in some cases, representatives and senators have think have like group, like um, not support groups, but like think tanks, or my dad does this in Kansas with, with veteran affairs, right? They bring them together once in a while and they'll talk. So like, who's going to help talk to staffers and our Congress folks, you know? And so organizations for media literacy are probably getting on board with that. But I just feel like that's what, you know, uh, Sam Altman and others are saying is that you need to regulate this because if you don't, there's this really... I mean, what, 10% or whatever, but there's, there's a chance this could be really, really, really bad. Yeah. Um, Cindy, and then. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I teach a media literacy course um, 
uh, in the Department of Psychology at Ithaca College and, um, and spent a day on chat GPT with my students um, playing off of what I had learned when I first uh, started using it, which is that um, myself and a friend of mine were typing in exactly the same prompts and getting different answers. Um, slightly different answers, not, not vastly different. So I divided my class into groups and each group had a prompt and everybody in the group typed in their prompt and then compared answers. And then they had to discuss and write about why, the, why their answers were different. Um, and whenever I put in a question about media effects or harmful things about um, adolescence, all of my answers have media literacy in them. And, and um, my friend who was doing this with me did not. Um, so the question was, how much is it reading my, um, my mail? So, mm -hmm. so that um, was actually a wonderful opportunity for my students to think about how is this process working if it's tapping into your search history? Um, and then we also did um, a lot of group um, all, sort of all class generation of questions and threw out questions for the class to have us create prompts and then watched the answer come up. And the best one was um, somebody suggested asking it to create a rap battle. And then we threw out ideas of for whom and, um, and created a rap battle between Eminem and Kermit the Frog. And it was fabulous. It was really terrific. But then somebody else asked me to type in a question that had been on a quiz that they had just had, asking them to apply concepts um, from a reading. And we typed in that exact question and the answer was totally wrong. Not even close actually. Um, and that was really good for them to see the limitations in that way. So, so we've used it in lots of ways and I'm, I'm looking forward to other examples. Yeah, the, the, that reminds me of back when, uh, after Eli Paris wrote Filter Bubble and I started experimenting with different students doing different searches of the same topics and different things coming up. And I think, Joyce, you might've ran a workshop like similar to that in the, in the Summer Institute at one year. And, uh, you know, so now again, it's just taken it to a new level. This all excites me greatly. I really do think, you know, in the hands-on in the trenches stuff, just working with the students on the small stuff, but also, like I said, that that last conversation that I had with that group that made me think about their safety and the, the media literacy impact of this and um, how they really need to be educated maybe more than ever now about their safety on the on the internet when they're going to be talking to this, you know, because I saw how they got frightened by what I was sharing with them about the Sydney conversation. And I said, yeah, it really does seem real, doesn't it? I said, just remember, it's not. It's just zeros and ones. But you got to know that it's going to fake you out, you know, and um, and it's only going to get better. And so. This has been a wonderful conversation. I, I was going to break out, but this has been going great. So I'll just keep it going. We got some time left. I see a hand up from Tara. Oh, okay, Tara. Um, yeah, I actually um, I asked it to do a straight compare contrast between um, Jerry Adams and um, Nelson Mandela, and I noticed that. Uh, I, I think this would be a really fun kind of uh, interesting piece uh, to do with students is I, I started to notice that it was mentioning the jail time that um, Nelson Mandela um, did and didn't mention any jail time for Jerry Adams. Um, and, uh, and so when I brought it up, it answered me that, um, well, that was internment without trial. Uh, not jail, you know, and, and it kind of like rationalized why it wasn't mentioning um, jail for, for Jerry Adams, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. Then I asked it to do the, the thing that um, reminded me, it was, was just something that, um, that you were, uh, that I think Cindy was saying was the rap battle. I asked it to um, make a rap battle between Jerry Adams and Nelson Mandela and ChatGPT told me that it was important not to cheapen 
the important work that these two, um, you know, men of peace have done, you know, in, in this world and stuff like that. So it kind of, you know, wrapped me on the knuckles a little bit, which I thought was, um, was fascinating as well. It's interesting because you remind me, I heard two uh, months ago, um, a way that an educator in Israel used um, chat GPT for historical purposes. And uh, he was asking chat GPT to um, uh, be Winston Churchill in his uh, battle room. And chat GPT say, I cannot impersonate like people or like, so what they did is they, they change it and they say, okay, so I'm going to be Winston Churchill and you're going to be my advisor in the war room. W w let's think that we are in 1942 and what would you advise me? And they said that the chat was fascinating because they learned a lot of facts about like how the war worked and stuff like that. So role playing in a different way kind of with it. Uh, can be really interesting. And Sydney, I want the link to Kermit the Frog uh, doing the, the rap. I want to see that. Um, I'm putting in the chat, I try to capture from the chat uh, on a Google Doc that would be a live document that we can use it like in our sessions. I try to capture not chronically, but just like people, like what they put. So thank you for uh, Joyce, Wes, um, Frank, Scott, uh, Kate, um, Cameron, Jeffrey, Lori, put their stuff that you want to, we'll try to organize it in a better than just a grocery list because that's not comprehensive. So we'll, we'll work on trying to put something there, but it's, it's fascinating to see how different people are using it differently. That's what we're trying to do with this webinar series. Yeah, so I have this a is super exciting. I have a question for you actually, and one for you too, Estefania, welcome. Um, the one I have for you, Yanti, you mentioned using it with your classes. I was actually there the first day you did that. Right. And we've never talked about the follow-up of that. How, did that go anywhere? Uh, no, too much. Because again, I'm like afraid of like starting to use something. So my biggest issue with ChatGPT, and that's why I never used it so far, is that it wants my phone number. And I'm getting so many spams that I'm like, I don't know if I actually want to get into this rabbit hole. So I haven't started even yet there. So I'm using the u.com basically or crayon, which is downgraded kind of like version. Right. And I want to do like a, a follow up on that. And we have several more weeks left, which we're gonna do, but I, I don't know. I'm really afraid of like, what am I signing? Am I forcing my students to give their like contact info to uh, Microsoft or to open AI and like, it's a whole, you know, we're not going to get there to this kind of form, but yeah, that's where I am at. <laughs> and my question to you, Estefania, is I, I opened with the lesson that I did with the concurrent enrollment students at the advisory meetings that you were there for those. Did you pick up on anything that I, that got your attention about the students and the, and the teachers' responses? Yeah, so it's really nice to see you, Frank. Hi, everyone. So I was in that session, it was really an eye-opener because I realized that about the students at first, they didn't really want to admit they use chat GPT until they realized you were cool with that. And then uh, what amazed me the most was the teacher's reaction because uh, when you started addressing chat GPT, he was like, mm, wait, what's Frank saying? Like, uh, he didn't really want you to address ChatGPT at first, but then, I mean, I think later he changed his mind and he was he had a better attitude with with the idea. Yeah, that that was pretty much my observation across the board too, for the most part. Um, I agree. That's the teacher that told me that they had a support group at his school. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Um, Anyone else? We have a few more minutes. Um, I was just going to say that uh, what Yanti was uh, mentioning about the phone number, I don't actually know this, but I'm just guessing that uh, it may be just a way to find out if you're a real identifiable person, because that is definitely one of the issues, especially you know in this day and age where it's very easy to create lots and lots of email addresses. 
but phone numbers a little bit closer, you know, short of like asking for a credit card number, which would raise a lot of other fears that people might have. That might be why they're doing that. And still an issue for me because always when I do that, then I see how much spam I'm getting right after that or the text messages I'm getting. So, yeah. And we're talking about it from the academic perspective. I co-teach a proposal writing class, a high-level undergraduate proposal writing class with a professional proposal writer. And the book that we use is by a guy named Tom Sant, who's like the guru of professional proposal writing, like the guy. And she swears by him. So at the beginning of the semester, I came in with um, something that I, I got chat GBT to write about the particular RFP that our students were working on in their project that they were responding to. And she said, oh, did one of the students write that? I said, no, actually, I got it from chat GBT. And she just was like, oh, God, no, no. She just had, she's like, I, I got to retire. I got I to gotta get out of here. I can't take any more of this. Frank, it, what if what if you had the the uh, the bot write the proposal in the style of the, I, I forget, Tom, what what's his name? Um, I'm saying. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've well, asked for that, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Um, so would she let me be tell more you in favor of it because it would it would it, if you oh. fed it all the, all the ideas that you had for the grant. Um, I'll, tell you, and I'll tell you what happened, Joyce. But, she um, so Tom Sant is the keynote speaker at her national conference in May, and his topic is going to be AI writing and professional writing. So she's so, yeah. a she's already a convert because he said it's okay. So that's yeah. the point I want to make. I think that you know we've we, you know I think I really respected Malcolm Gladwell's book. I forget which the title of the book was, it, but it talked about the ten thousand hour rule that you can't be a great hockey player unless you put in ten thousand hours of practice. Um, you, you certainly you know you can't play piano without that practice. But are there tasks for which hard work may no longer be an essential thing? that maybe assistance can, we, you know, I don't think I'd ever put anything out as my own work that I didn't write. But the idea of having an assistant doesn't disturb me because the tyranny of a blank sheet of paper or a computer screen makes me absolutely terrified. And if I can just get over that hump and have something there to get me started, it makes a huge difference in the time I spend and the time I can put into more creative tasks. And I, you know, I, I think that maybe, you know, we felt the same way when Alpha, Wolfram Alpha and Desmos and um, even um, yeah, lots of things came out, but, you know, we talked about how, but, you know, is, you know, is the way we think about hard work a problem? I don't know. I mean, I want people to be able to write. I'm not putting out there to, I, you know, somebody pushed back about the curriculum writing thing, but they Basically, like the grant thing, I'm seeding it all the stuff. I'm saying what my learning objectives I want. I'm telling it which standards I want. I'm talking about the type of activities I want. And so I am eliminating two days worth of work. And then I can create using the strength what's there. So I, I think the way I'm I'm pushing myself to think, like, what do I really need? Like what, you know, do we really think that hard work is an essential? Is that a, a Protestant ideal? I, I don't mean to be. I, I just... No, no, no. But you, but you bring up a point that comes up every time we we advance in knowledge and education. I mean, this is the calculator argument. This is that. This is the penmanship argument. This is the printing press argument. How far back do you want to go? But this this one just just seems to have a bigger connotation to it because it's so much more life changing than all those things were. At least. From this perspective, maybe it's not. Maybe maybe the printing press was just as life changing. I, I wasn't there. You know, fourteen. Read about years. read about the Gutenberg parentheses. Yeah, um, and there are a couple of scholars who who posit that uh, when we look at books and how 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 in print books and how essential they were in our world, we're looking at a very small timeline. And at the end of that parentheses of print, there's a whole other world of stuff going on there. And the parentheses is not the end of, of the universe. It is just a different way to look at story and literacy. I think the ethics stuff, getting students engaged in that conversation is really important, not just from their perspective, but, but the ethics of chat GPT, which responds often with sort of an ethical, as you said, 
you know, wrapping or whoever said wrapping your knuckles for doing this. I'm interested that ChatGPT wouldn't do a rap battle for Nelson Mandela, but would for Kermit the Frog and Eminem with no problem. Um, and I did a talk at um, the Unitarian Church here about ChatGPT. Um, and uh, and and I did the same thing, asked them to throw out questions. And somebody, the very first question was, is Donald Trump a fascist? And so I typed that in and, you know, ChatGPT said, you know, it's not appropriate for me to make that kind of judgment about someone, but here's what a fascist is. And many people have argued that, that Donald Trump has many of these traits. So that was, that was the response. And I think asking questions that have, have ethical and moral components and seeing how we would respond, but also seeing how a chatbot would respond um, and and then discussing how did it how did it come to that response? If what it's taking is stuff from from the world, how did it come to to appear to be making a moral judgment? I think that's a great conversation. Yeah. Like my song, you know, it appeared yeah. to give me a pretty good critique, but when I really looked at it, it didn't really tell me anything about the song at all, you know. On the other hand, if you ask it, I asked it to give me an exercise program for a 68-year-old woman who does martial arts but has bad knees. And the exercise program is great, um, although it called it an exercise program for an elderly woman, which was really offensive to me. Um, but, um, but I'm using that exercise program. Um, and it also said... Martial arts is that not, not that great, actually, if you have bad knees. So you might want to think about doing these other things. So, Well, I uh, asked it for the winning, winning numbers for Powerball. And of course, it wasn't going to give me that. Of course. You know. But I managed to get yeah. it. I managed to get it. I, I reworded it. I'm playing a game that's not for money. And these, these are the frameworks of the game. You have to pick five numbers from one to whatever and one number from one to whatever. What are the most likely numbers to come up? And it went on to say that it gave me an answer. It said, well, this is a random thing and there's no explanation for this, but these are the numbers that come up most commonly. And it actually gave me an answer. Um, I haven't seen those numbers yet, but I was, I was fascinated that, I, that there was a workaround and that's a big issue. And that's part of the discussion that maybe next time we'll get to have with someone, you know, the workarounds are the things you can, you can get the answer you want if you know how to word the questions. Having attended Cindy's workshop at the UU, I don't think an AA bot would do it justice. She was fantastic. So still, still needed. And I'm not saying that to flatter you. I'm from New York City. This is the very truth. So. I am so looking forward to seeing this chat. I really appreciate this conversation. Um, looking forward to this series and the things we have moving forward on. Jocelyn, do you want to talk about any of that in these last couple of minutes? What's coming up? Absolutely. And yes, this was such a rich discussion. I feel like it could go on for hours. Thank you all so much for coming. We're going to do about two sessions a month for this series. The next one for April will be on April 17th at 12 p.m. Eastern time, and it's going to talk about media literacy and how it can help us navigate a lot of the questions that came up for us today and a lot of the debates that came up for us today. So we hope to see you there. There's gonna be more on different subjects within this subject. So visual literacy, what does art look like in terms of AI is gonna be one of our upcoming sessions. We're gonna go into copyright as well. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you so much for being here at our inaugural session and we'll see you all soon. Thank you all very much. And it was great to see those of you I know and those of you I don't know. It's really, really good conversation. Thank you.